Great. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to see the names of the four different experts we have this evening. We have Sarah Fernandez, who is the CEO of um, the Oxford Hub. We have Dr. Raj Kumar, who is the Chief Medical Officer and the founder of Mirad Pharmaceuticals. We're going to have um, Councillor Shaista Aziz, who is a city councillor here in Oxford. And then finally, we have Miranda Townsend, who is a program officer at the Entrepreneurship Center, the University of Oxford. So to get started, um, we're going to request uh, doc Dr. Raj Kumar to start off with his presentation. He, as I mentioned, he is the Chief Medical Officer and founder of Mirad Pharmaceuticals. He's also the co-founder of Pharma Cambridge and Arcesa Pharma. His academic background is in psychiatry and neurology. And he has also served as a committee member for the Wellcome Trust, which focuses on affordable healthcare funding. Thank you. Um, Zui, you have the slides ready? Can you yes. share them with everybody? Fantastic. So, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much to Zara and Zuhi for the invitation. I'm very privileged uh, to be amongst you today. Zara and Zuhi have told me a great deal of the work your group does, and you should be commended and congratulated uh, on, on what you're doing. I'm going to, uh, next slide, uh, sorry, first slide, please. It's, it's the one with the background. It says background, Zuhi. Can you get to the oh, first? Oh, um, okay, one second. Is it, is it overview? No, background. Uh, slide one. Ah, no. okay, sure. Apologies. Slide. Slide. Yeah. Yes, sure. Apologies. Let me get this. Uh, there we go. Okay, so fantastic. Thank you, Zara. Uh, I'm going to give you a bit of a background and set the scene um, to, to the remit Zuhi had uh, put to me. And just as a way of starting, as you probably know all, all of this information anyway, as of two days ago, the World Health Organization reported nearly 5 million cases of COVID-19. And worldwide, there's been more than 300,000 deaths, and of which 37,000 are in the UK. This new virus um, <clears throat> named COVID-19 um, comes with a range of symptoms which have been fairly unpredictable, but about 80% of us who may be infected with this virus, the symptoms are very mild, no more than a cough or some fever or some fatigue, and maybe loss of sense of smell and taste. However, about 20% of us may have very severe symptoms which requires hospital intervention. The risk to healthcare workers is a vulnerability in the healthcare, whether it's Oxford, Cambridge, or rest of the world. And because by the nature of the health profession, you can't work remote, remotely, and really we need to employ um, early strategies for frontline healthcare and other hospital staff uh, for, for testing and management, which sadly is still lacking. As a result of the social distancing, which has been proposed, self-isolation or travel restriction or workforce restriction, the economic sector is suffering so much so, so that uh, all the forecasts from the economic uh, losses, including a report from Oxford, says that the economy is going to sink and shrink substantially with losses of severe job disproportionately affecting the poorer members of the society. And essentially in relation to mental health, there is, there is no health without mental health. And this is very much evidenced already. Next slide, please. Again, mental health 
in a, in a clinical sense is defined as a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own abilities and can cope with normal stresses of everyday life and can work productively and fruitfully and make a contribution not only to the society but to humanity in general. If we really look at clinical mental disorders, these include depression, schizophrenia, dementia, and other which I won't go through, but there's a, there's a few points to make. When you make a diagnosis of a mental disorder, it's not like diagnosing other chronic disease such as heart disease, where we can do ECGs or we can do blood pressures, or if you have diabetes, we can look at blood glucose. The issue really is that mental illnesses have multiple causes, genetic, biological, social, and environmental, and it relies upon our ability uh, to talk to the person and assess uh, on the basis of inter dyadic interaction on what that mental illness or disorder should be and how we should manage it in terms of whether it's a drug therapy or talking therapy. Um, and I'll come on to uh, some of these later on. Uh, next slide, please. You may or may not be surprised to know these are actual figures only from a few days ago that at any one time, one in six people of working age have symptoms associated with mental health. And one in four people experience mental health issues every year. Globally, there are nearly a billion people who are affected by mental health. The, the impact is that in the UK, or more precisely in England alone, mental illness is the second largest source of burden of disease. And because they are common, they're long lasting, and they're impactful than other health conditions. And each year, due to uh, mental health illnesses, the estimated cost of care varies from 74 mil, a billion to 99 billion in costs. And people with mental health conditions are maybe not optimally pro productive and they're at risk of losing their job. And every year, about 300,000 people lose their jobs because of mental health conditions. The other thing to mention is that some of these illnesses do start early. And what may surprise you that there is a very high risk of suicides uh, in this country as, as, as well as in the US of A. And what will even surprise you more that more than 70% people who have a diagnosable mental illness receive no formal professional psychiatric help. Next slide, please. So the, the, the thing which makes life very difficult in mental disorders is the diagnosis is often insufficient and because it's largely clinical and, and exper experiential, and the treatment is very pragmatic and it has relationship about policy, uh, policies of health management and it has a bearing on population, people, pressures and poverty, some of which you are very well aware of in the recent media. In relation to infections in general, uh, next slide please, Dara. There was a publication from University College London uh, only four days ago in the Lancet, and I'm using this um, as an illustration, and Professor Rogers and his team looked at psychiatric and neuropsychiatric presentations with severe coronavirus infection, where they did a meta-analysis 
and comparisons. And if you do get the chance, you know, do, do take a look at the published paper. If you go to the next slide, essentially there are two points, uh, uh, two key points to make here. This is not the first time we are getting an infection epidem uh, epidemiology point of view or pandemic point of view. And there have been uh, a number of outbreaks with either uh, one called SARS, which is severe acute respiratory syndrome uh, in uh, 2002. And, and in the Middle East, there was Mars, which started in 2012. And uh, Professor Rogers and his team looked at nearly 2,000 studies over many countries. Um, and, and the number of uh, cases included in these studies was nearly 4,000. And essentially, um, what they found that during the acute illness of uh, COVID-like pandemics, uh, the patients admitted to hospital for SARS or MAR included um, uh, symptoms of confusion, depressed mood, anxiety, impaired memory, and lack, uh, uh, lack of sleep. If the COVID-19 follows a very similar course to what we already know, and if, you, if we treat the infection, patients should recover without experiencing mental illnesses, which are clinically needs management. Um, but all clinicians and health workers should be aware of the possibility of depression, anxiety, fatigue, post-traumatic stress disorder, and there may be other uh, rarer syndromes. And one thing I want to illustrate to you, because this has been often associated with indirect exposures to stimuli called post-traumatic stress disorder. Please go to the next slide. You may not get infection by the virus. You may not know anybody who's had symptoms of this, but by reading about it, by seeing things in the media, you may start to develop what we now call post-traumatic stress disorder. And you know, a lot of the people uh, after disasters, uh, whether against one individual or, or against um, uh, society as a whole have been well documented through history. Here, the problem is whatever symptoms you, you have, you have three components. You have re-experiencing of the symptoms associated with that exposure, and it's basically could be flashbacks or nightmares. And the second one is avoidance and em emotional blunting where, you know, in the case of uh, COVID-19, people still, even if you tell them they can go out, may say, you know, it's too risky. So there's social withdrawal, and that is then exhibited in their affect. Or you could be, you know, have a hyper arousal where you have a startle response and you panic uh, more frequently together with sleep disturbances. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of the conclusions uh, the London group has come, come up with, essentially what we have to do is to be very cautious because the data is still emerging and we don't know when this outbreak may finish so we can get actual data on morbidity and mortality. And, and we need to know whether this infection uh, was associated or correlated with poor psychiatric outcomes. The information from previous studies says that confusion and clinical uh, mental problem are a common feature that, that we should be aware of. And, those, th um, and these include looking out for clinical evidence of depression, anxiety, PTSD, or fatigue. And, and we also should be aware that people who get admitted into the hospital may have other neuropsychiatric components to the illness, but clearly the focus has to be trying, trying to uh, treat uh, 
the underlying disorder next, please. Now, the etiology of the psychiatric con consequences in infections are likely to be multifactorial, whether you have a viral infection on top of, the, of which you get a bacterial infection, whether you have some underlying disease like heart problems or, um, or other immunological uh, problem. You could be on some medication. There could be social isolation. There could be psychological impact uh, of other illnesses. So there are a whole lot of uh, factors that we need to be aware of. And, and what we need to do is to, to try and look at it to see how we can actually measure these things. Uh, next slide, please. My old professor, Professor David Nutt, who, who helped me with, with uh, training and uh, experience, he actually wrote a response to the publication and he confirms uh, again in his uh, quote that many infections leave a psychiatric legacy. He's already had several patients asking for support after they've recovered from their original diagnosis of depression. He cites that in, even in 1957, a number of cases of severe and treatment resistant depression emerged and, and these required um, intensive management, which includes drug therapies, because the neurotransmitters in the brain, such as noradrenaline, dopamine, or serotonin, may be affected. If you go to the next slide, now, one of the problems that I alluded to, the diagnosis is not simple, but if you really look at the way I used to see patients, I would spend five minutes looking at their drug therapies and looking to see how they were taking it, compliance, uh, and any side effects or adverse event. But I would spend 55 minutes talking to the patient if I had a one hour session, which was the normal. And you know, we need to understand that a healthcare worker with some training in psychology, psychiatry, or neurology who are looking at infections, we need to assess the at-risk patients and subjects, which include ideas of suicide, ideas of, um, of PTSD, or other complex presentation in terms of anxiety. We still are dogged with social stigma of saying, I might have psychiatric or psychological problem. Thirdly, there is too much information on the web, which is complex and confusing. So if you say to somebody, uh, you know, look up how you are, uh, if you have anxiety symptoms, this is what you need to do. I think there is a need with people with any kind of presentation uh, to talk to real people with walk-in centers so we can help them to develop resilience, but more importantly, um, you know, as you guys are looking to see how you can intervene, how can we make the use of technology easier, more friendly, like you've been doing in your breakout session, or you have all of these people on the call today? And again, how can we make talking therapies, of which cognitive behavioral therapy is one, via telemedicine, so somebody uh, like me, who may be involved in, in managing patients with some fine kind of talking therapy, builds the rapport that one would do if it was face to face, uh, uh, as opposed to being on a video camera or on a telephone call. And finally, because of waiting list uh, resources, you know, there may be a time period when you have no contact and people will. Um, will uh, suffer more and may deteriorate. So we have to really be in a position to make it affordable and accessible. Final slide, please, Ara. So I think I wanted to put that in the context of what you uh, guys are discussing and maybe formulating your thought on how you can effectively uh, intervene. So what I wanted to leave you with the thought 
while there is increased public scrutiny and within the constraint of the limitation of resources and the growing social, um, economic and medical impact of this uh, pandemic, we need to focus and provide patient-focused scientific and clinical leadership for all sectors of society, you know, not merely um, selected person in, in an equal manner and which is accessible and affordable. I'm going to stop there. Uh, sorry, it's, um, it's a bit of an overview with things you may be familiar with, but I thought it will be worth setting the scene for you guys. I, I'll be happy to take any questions now, but both Zara and uh, Zuhi have my contact details, and I would be happy to engage in any form whatsoever as you guys require, because I think you guys are doing phenomenally um, good work which needs to be supported. Thank you, Zara. Thank you, Zuhi. I'll leave, leave it at that. Thank you so much. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, you can raise your hand right now, and then we can maybe take a couple of questions if, if that's um, something you guys want to do. Okay. I don't see any, so we're going to move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Miranda Townsend. She is the program officer for the Entrepreneurship Center at the Said Business School. She manages several European grant programs as well as the Said Business School's newest initiative, which is called the LIBA Project, which is all about collaboration in the context of this crisis. So Miranda, over to you. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna share my screen. Working? Yep. Great. So thank you so much uh, for having me here today. It's a real pleasure um, and it's really great to see what amazing work and initiatives um, are being built to support each other and the community in such challenging times. So thank you. Um, hopefully my insights of what we have learned so far with the Libra project can support you um, over this weekend um, and thinking about how SMEs can recover and return to normality in the shortest possible time. Um, I'll do a very quick introduction of what the Entrepreneurship Centre is, and then I'll talk a bit more about what the Libra project is, where we're currently at with it, um, and our findings from that. So the Entrepreneurship Centre at Oxford Said supports our student and alumni community in pursuing their entrepreneurial ambitions. We work with other departments across the school to support the curricular and co-curricular work of our students. Um, we do this by engaging with thought leadership across the university, as well as providing several programmes and events for our entrepreneurial community. Some of the programmes that we organise are designed to support and enhance um, the journey of our students, and some of them include um, the ones on the screen, so the Oxford Seed Fund, uh, the Entrepreneurship Project, which is a core core part of the MBA and Ember curriculum, so they design a venture throughout the year and have to present that back. Uh, the Oxford Site Entrepreneurship Forum, so that's it, our annual conference where we bring together about 400 attendees each year with some amazing speakers um, and investors for everybody to meet each other, which is great. We have our own network, which is a dedicated um, mentor pool for our students and alumni and Ideas to Impact, which helps students um, in medical sciences and MPLS divisions build entrepreneurial skills by inviting them to some um, cyber school lectures. Our newest program um, is the Libra Project. Libra means free in Latin, so we chose this name um, in reference to feeling free to be in charge, to reframe and shape your future. So what is the Libra Project? Uh, it's a four month program which is running from, from now in May till September this year. Uh, we're connecting SMEs with our Oxford Said community and our Oxford Said community will actively support businesses facing new challenges due to COVID-19. And it will also allow our Oxford Said community to gain practical work experience and make a difference that they wish. So where did we start? Uh, we knew we needed to mobilise quickly because of the ever-changing nature of the crisis, as well as the limited um, time in which the current cohort of students are at the school. So we decided to use a design thinking method methodology to plan, um, to plan the programme and design it, 
where our first step uh, was to empathize with our customers and to define their challenges. We conducted 60 interviews with businesses, um, so UK startups, scale-ups and SMEs, um, with our students, with our alumni and other various stakeholders. Um, the interviews gave us an in-depth understanding of the real needs and the real challenges of these particular groups so that we could use this data to build our initiative. So a challenge for us as a team was working remotely. Um, we were all having to find new innovative ways of working and putting together data and analyzing it. So this is just a screenshot of one of our um, rather messy workings, but it was when we were putting together our, our findings from our interviews within into themes. So the themes that we grouped um, were into several main um, themes that we identified. So for example, well-being, finance, digital transformation, networks, legal, sales and marketing, and strategy and innovation. For the students, it was slightly different. Um, their main challenges were the, the different job market that they're facing, um, that they, they weren't expecting um, that, that challenge. And also a lot of them had cancelled internships um, and some cancelled job offers as well. I thought it'd be helpful to go into a bit more detail in terms of the challenges that we identified. So I've put on the screen um, some screenshots surrounding the particular themes and I'll pick out a few of the key findings from that um, so you can get an understanding of what the real challenges were that we spoke to these companies about. So for example, surrounding strategy innovation, um, something came up about how businesses um, can you use strategy and innovation to ensure that they are agile and to adjust the business um, to still support customers? Another challenge was that startups now have uh, now need to have a much longer term view than they traditionally would, and also that some are seeing an increase in business but having a difficulty adapting and scaling. Within sales, there were concerns over if people stopped using the product or service, then customers might not go back to it and concerns over supplies chain slowing and stopping sales. Within marketing, um, one business was concerned about whether it's ethically right to talk about business as usual anymore, and SMEs don't know how to communicate during the crisis without looking frivolous. We separated digital transformation from marketing as there were several focused directly on this element, um, including how to run events online, how to run projects that rely on physical collaboration and take businesses online. There were some also hard hitting findings um, that we found that we kind of grouped with illegal, such as when to furlough, how to keep GDPR compliant whilst working from home, and how and when to make people redundant. With HR and wellbeing, um, some examples included hiring and onboarding online for those who needed access to new talent quickly if they were scaling, managing teams remotely and keeping up motivation, and the difficulty of working from home and the feeling of isolation. Another was networking support. So, losing one-to-one -one interaction because of the virtual world um, and some large companies not engaging the services of SMEs as they usually would. The key theme, the biggest theme that we found um, was the overarching title of finance. So I've, we've split this into three kind of broad categories, including cash flow, grants and loans and investment and funding. With cash flow, uh, there were concerns around how long would their cash flow last. Early stage startups need cash, cash and more cash. And 50% of businesses have cash for 30 days or less in the current situation. With surrounding investment and funding, um, examples of challenges we found included how SMEs had to push back fundraising timelines, they were nearly impossible to close any new external rounds and investors becoming highly selective even within their current portfolios. 
With grants and loans, um, we found that they were struggling to find ones not related to COVID-19 and to find out which grants were available at all. So our next step in the design thinking process was to use our findings from our data and come up with new ideas to solve these challenges. We use the themes to identify how might we challenges to support our ideation process. For example, how might we support startups and SMEs to build new solutions to remain relevant? Or how might we provide support to our startups and SMEs to increase their financial runway? We then use these challenges um, for a brain dump to generate as many ideas as possible in response to the challenges within a certain amount of time as a team. Uh, you can see uh, uh, an example of this on the slide with lots of ideas surrounding one challenge. From these ideas, we then built and refined our concept paper. Uh, that's where we went into detail on the description of our offer, our risks and our counterpoints, and our target and impact. The final step and the final stage is the implementation stage, um, which is the stage we're currently at now. So what are the elements that make up the LIBA project? The first element is the connectivity between the students and alumni and the companies that we spoke to. Therefore, each company in our portfolio, which is 35 UK startups and SMEs, um, will have a business unit assigned to them. And this business unit will be formed of a multidisciplinary group of um, two to three MBAs, one executive MBA or alumni, um, an external expert, perhaps from our um, own network, and we have a couple of undergrads and diploma students in there too. So each business unit will play an advisory and consultancy role over the four month programme to this cohort of companies. And through this, our students are gaining the, the crucial practical experience of working with these real companies and the, the businesses are getting that crucial um, support and skills from those individuals who can guide them through these difficult times. We're also connecting um, some of our students with these companies for free internships, unpaid internships, which is obviously a great benefit for the companies as well as for the students. The second element of the LIBA project um, that we have built in response to the challenges that we identified is an online series of specialised content. It's going to generally be in the form of masterclasses facilitated by one of our Oxford side faculty in conversation with a leading business practitioner in that field. Um, some examples um, are on the screen of who we've confirmed so far. For example, um, co-founder and CEO of Headspace um, is coming in next week to talk, do a talk about um, well-being. The content of these is being um, defined and changed and flexible as we move, as as we're adapting to the needs of these companies. But so, but for example, so far we have some topics surrounding um, scenario planning, understanding the investor universe, the art of pivoting and leadership. Uh, both the students and the companies are gonna be able to attend these masterclasses and workshops, um, but there'll also be specific consultancy advice for our students. We're extremely happy with the response we've had so far. Uh, in a narrow application window of just one week, we had applications from 70 startups and SMEs, um, who of which we selected 35. We also had 180 student and alumni applications, of which we accepted nearly 120. And there are currently 70 internships on offer from these companies. So where are we now? Um, we're currently creating and matching these business units and the internships. And we've also kicked off our online content, which started this week with the theme of leadership. Thanks very much. Please do feel free to reach out to me um, and I can answer any questions at any point. So thank you. Thank you so much, Miranda. Uh, if anyone has any questions, you can raise your hand using the Zoom feature and we can take a couple of questions if anyone has any. Great, okay, so we're gonna move on to our third speaker. Our third speaker is Sarah, who is the CEO of Oxford Hub, the Center for Social Action in the City of Oxford. 
She is also a research fellow at the Center for Youth Impact, and she's also served as a trustee for various UK-based charities. Sarah, on to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Community Engagement Challenge. Um, so I'll talk about uh, what the Oxford Hub does and what normal times community engagement has looked like for us. But I will also talk about the opportunity that um, we can have after this pandemic to look at what communities could look like in the future. So in normal times, Oxford Hub is a social action charity that connects people in Oxford and particularly focuses on relationships across people who wouldn't otherwise have met. So these might be uh, connecting people who don't speak English, maybe because they're refugees or new migrants, with people with whom they can share um, language um, skills and learn English. It might be uh, children in care being supported by young professionals across the city and being, being there for them, uh, or it might be intergenerational friendships. And the reason why we focus on relationships is that we believe that actually those relationships are the key to having a more um, connected and resilient city. Um, a lot of the time, people who maybe have had more of a middle class upbringing, they can rely on their social capital and their social networks, whether it is, you know, if um, your door breaks and you need someone to borrow some tools, or if you have a child and they need some work experience uh, or support in any other way. So we are trying to think how can communities come together to support each other. And that is particularly important in a city like Oxford, um, which is actually one of the national cold spots for social mobility. And what that means is that depending on where you are born in the city, you are much less likely to um, actually be able to achieve academically and you are much more likely to suffer from poor health and have a much lower life expectancy. So what we do in normal times is lots of volunteering programs and we place about 850 to 900 volunteers every year in different programs. We also do lots of collaboration initiatives and that is working with the police, with the local authority and with a range of local partners in the voluntary sector to tackle specific issues that might be going on. Um, so, for example, a couple of years ago, we worked on the community response to the closure of children's centres. Uh, we are currently focusing on breaking the cycle of intergenerational poverty in some areas in East Oxford, so working across four specific words supporting children and their families as a unit, not just uh, through youth work, but providing much more holistic family support. So that's our normal times work. Um, since the um, coronavirus pandemic started, we launched uh, something called Oxford Together, which is an opportunity for everyone in the city to offer support, solidarity, and mutual aid to their neighbors and to people who might need help for any reasons. So Oxford Together has been um, an amazing effort that has leveraged uh, over 1,500 people who have been active through the program already. Um, over 5,000 people signed up to just put up their hand and say, I am here, I can help. And the big question for us is, how do we take forward this community engagement? So I'm going to share a screen and I'm going to show you a little bit of how the distribution of volunteers is across the city. So let me see if I can share a screen. Um, mm, 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 mm. Share. So if you know Oxford, this is Oxford City, and what we have here is about 900 people who have signed up to make a difference in and just run practical support errands for their neighbors. So whether it's picking up a prescription, mowing the loan for someone who's disabled and cannot do that for themselves, um, walking their, you know, the dog of a person who is shielding, doing the school run for a disabled mom whose usual school run isn't happening. So 900 people have signed up. Through this practical support system alone, we've had nearly 1,300 instances of volunteering. So many of them will be people who are maybe uh, on the first week of lockdown, were paired up with an older person and are doing their shopping and have, their, have done their shopping every week for the past um, 10 weeks. 
So what we have is an amazing network of people who are really active and really motivated. So every time we call anyone with a request for help, everyone has been you know, really keen and really eager to help. Um, there are some challenges with that. So we have fewer volunteers in regeneration areas. Um, however, we also have a higher number uh, of requests for support in regeneration areas. So what we are trying to do is balance the fact that we don't have, um, you know, you, you don't want to overwhelm the few people who are in those region areas, but at the same time, we don't want to bring people who live really far away onto those areas because what we're trying to do is where possible, create long-term sustainable relationships. And you're much more likely to help someone who maybe lives 10 minutes away from you than to help someone who maybe lives 40 minutes away from you. Um, so that is one of the challenges that we have. Um, a lot of the interesting um, issues that are coming up more widely in the sector, not just with us, is this fear that as people go back to work, as the pandemic ends, fewer people will want to remain involved. And I think that that really depends on how you approach the issue of um, volunteering. So. For most schemes out there, including the National Volunteering Scheme through the NHS, the problem they're trying to fix is the problem of task allocation to volunteers. So they know that Doris needs her shopping every week. Now, every week, a task is generated and allocated to different volunteers. And so Doris is getting a different person every week. Um, if Doris signs up to the daily phone check-in, which is something that we've already been, we've also been doing from the very beginning, Doris will actually get a different person phoning her every day just to check on her. However, what we're trying to do is not to solve for, for the problem of task allocation, but to solve for the problem of relationships. So actually, if you live in Oxford and you have an extended family or you have lots of neighbors who you already know, you don't need to come through us to ask for help with your shopping because there is someone who you know who you can already ask for help. So what we're interested in is how can we use the pandemic as an opportunity to create more relationships so that people have those in the future, regardless of whether volunteers go to work or don't go to work, they can still um, be involved and help. And that is the main um, difference between what Oxford Together is doing and what lots of other schemes across the county and across the country are doing. Um, and it is what I'm most interested in when it comes to community engagement. And I think that relationship piece is somehow at the center of um, any solutions that we want to build. So how do you build a more connected and a more relationship based city um, for the future so that whether the next issue is a flood or another pandemic or just the fact, for example, that the levels of unemployment are going to be so high over the next year, two years, three years, and that is going to have so many negative repercussions in terms of poverty, income and resources, particularly for the least uh, affluent families. What is the relational network that exists, which doesn't fix the problem that people don't have jobs, but actually mitigates some of the risks um, around poverty and actually gives people a sense of purpose and community. So that is it for me in terms of uh, Oxford Together. You can find more online under oxfordtogether.org. And if you want to find out more about Oxford Together behind the scenes, you can get in touch with me over email over the weekend. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, does anyone have any questions at this moment? I have a question through chat. Um, can I, how can we capitalize on this current search in support and ensure that it's maintaining the recovery phase of the pandemic? Um, so yeah, that is a question that we are like, the, le the question about legacy is really important for us. I think something that is really important for everyone to bear in mind is that the feedback at the moment is that people are getting more support now than they were getting before the pandemic. So, you know, there is a disabled mom who currently has someone who phones her every day, someone who takes the kids to school, a food parcel, and she's, she thinks it's amazing. And she's really worried that as the, you know, coronavirus situation resolves, that's not something that is going to be in place with her. So how can we almost promote that in communities for that to exist in the long term? 
And I think there's a raised hand. I don't know if that's to me or to everyone. Uh, I have a question. Can you hear me, Sarah? Yeah. So you mentioned earlier about you, you have some like, you were Im implementing practical ways to sort of engage families that have gone through like generational poverty or disadvantage. And I was wondering what kind of practical methods you've employed and how, which ones have been most successful? So just before the pandemic, we had started a project called Families in Charge, which is all around giving uh, families the opportunity to take matters into their own hands and think about what is it that they want, what are their goals rather than agencies or social services or someone else telling them what they have to do. Um, I don't think there are any obvious answers, but we really think that at the heart of a lot of these issues is the issue of the lack of social capital. So we were supporting a mom whose child um, was removed from her because she started dealing drugs and she got caught and obviously she ended up in prison. Social services removed her child. Now she ended up dealing drugs because she didn't have any money and she said to her friend, hey, I need a job, I need some money. And she said, oh, I deal drugs, you can deal drugs with me. However, if she had had a wider network, maybe the person she would have asked for a job she wouldn't have recommended a drug dealing job. So it is around thinking in what ways can we expand uh, those families' networks and enable them to achieve their goals, in this case, making some money to support her family in ways that are more diverse than perhaps the limited options that they have historically had because their families haven't had the education or those opportunities. And I've got another question uh, from Leo, which is, have you implemented alternative ways and digitalized solutions to continue these services? So at the moment, a lot of our focus is on matching tasks that come through uh, with volunteers. So for example, uh, someone will be in touch and say, a tree has fallen in my garden, I am disabled, I wanna use the garden, but I can't anymore because the tree is here. So we will find a volunteer who can go and remove the tree. Or I am shielding and I cannot go to the shops, I need someone to do the shopping for me. So that is the focus of our work at the moment. And like that, we've done over 1,200 pairings. Now, it's very low tech and those relationships are between the person and the volunteer and we have quite limited visibility over them other than the fact that they're happening. So when, every time you do your, someone shopping, you just submit a little form online. So no other moving anything online as of yet. <laughs> And someone asked me about seeing the back end uh, to Oxford together, and I am happy to show that um, to anyone after this meeting or over the weekend. Well, great. Um, any more questions? Uh, and so a couple of people have asked for my email and that's on the website, but it's also sarah at oxfordhub.org. So I have just put, popped it on the chat. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was such a helpful talk, just like the others. Uh, and now we're going to have our fourth and final talk for the evening. Our speaker is Councillor Shaista Aziz, who is the councillor for the Oxford City Council. She is also a journalist, a writer, a stand-up comedian, and a former international aid worker. So Shaista, um, the floor is yours. Hi, good evening everyone. Hi, it's really nice to see you all. I hope you can hear me. Um, just to clarify, people always ask me about the stand-up comedy, and I say it's a very natural progression from journalism aid work into politics it flows very well just to, just just so we're clear on that um so i'm really really um delighted to join you this evening and thank you so much for also um making time in your um in your event to speak about homelessness which is um uh an issue that obviously has global resonance um and covid19 is making this issue um even more important for us to tackle it as is all the inequality in, in the so-called developed world and the developing world so i just wanted to start um by giving a bit of context so um in the uk there are currently 320,000 people um who are uh homeless and Amongst the 320,000 people are 120,000 children. Now, obviously, um, numbers don't really um, tell us anything about the day-to-day -day 
reality of what this means and the impact it has on one's life and one's life chances. Um, and in 2019, at least 726 people died on the streets of the United Kingdom. Um, these, these individuals are deemed to be rough sleepers, which is the term that's used for them. Um, obviously, they're not rough sleepers, they're human beings um, whose life obviously took a course that perhaps we couldn't imagine. Um, but that is a very devastating um, number of people to die in a very rich country. Sadly, a number of people died in the city of Oxford, which, as you know, is one of the richest uh, in the whole of the UK world. There's a lot of wealth in our city, there's a lot of power in the centre of the city. I hope because my uh, internet connection is playing up a bit. Um, that's the cost, um, in terms of the bigger picture and here in Oxford um, uh, I wanted to try and give you a sort of picture of what's going on is if you are if you are sleeping on the streets um, some of you to out of your streets because by the nature of your of your existence of your lifestyle you may not be people you may be hiding today so for example but um in the last few years to 80 people sleeping on the streets of Oxford this number goes up at the moment um we uh, there's a there's a landing that there are there are around 40 plus people sleeping on the street what at the moment this is before the lockdown started the COVID-19 now um and what happens is every year there's a street count that takes place across the country. It happens on a specific day of the year in winter. And depending on the situation that day, so for example, if it's raining, if it's snowing, if it's very cold, it impacts how many people you are like you count as sleeping because if the is really bad, then what often happens is people go and seek shelter elsewhere. And so it, you may not be able to count everybody um, accurately. So again, I emphasize this because um, I'm, I'm not someone who believes in, num in the numbers games, inverted commas. I think we have to look at everybody as an individual and we have to look at their circumstances. But we um, are a city that does have a large number of people who are rough sleeping and also people who are homeless in, and in the homeless system. And um, one of the, there are many reasons for this, but one of the reasons is that um, we are a very small city, but we are very well connected. So it's very easy to move around from Oxford. Um, we are also known as a city that is generous in its attitude and behaviors towards people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, I definitely uh, apply that to the student community communities in our city, very much known for um, being very generous and for doing lots of voluntary work with a number of uh, Oxford organizations and also students organizing their own voluntary um, outreach programs as well um, and across around Oxford so Oxford is um, the, the local authority in Oxford is Oxford City Council and around Oxfordshire is the county so it's Oxfordshire County Council that is the authority for the areas around uh, Oxford and there has been huge huge um, uh, cuts made to local government over the last 10 years of, of the austerity program and specifically these cuts have hit the areas around the city of Oxford so what we're also seeing and what we have been seeing is um, numbers of people coming into Oxford who are living in towns and villages around the city because there are no services for them so this is also putting additional pressure on the city's services and on the budget as well to be able to um, provide services for people who are specifically either sleeping or homeless. Now, in the past um, two years, there's been a lot of progress um, in the city in terms of uh, the kind of facilities that are being developed for people who are on the streets in particular, or people who um, are at the very early stages of entering the homelessness system, so that they will be referred on to um, different types of housing um, uh, independently. So, um, this year, um, the council opened a 1.9 million homeless shelter called Floyd's Row, which is right in the centre of Oxford. Um, the brilliant thing about this shelter is that it's the first time the city council has designed a homeless shelter with the people who are actually experiencing rough sleeping. So it was um, designed along with Oxford City Council and an architecture firm called Transition by Design. 
um, is an Oxford-based organisation. I'd urge you to look at, look at their work and find out a bit more about their ethical approach to these issues. And so it's really important that when we're providing services for people, um, it's done in collaboration with them and with their agency not being removed. So I think this is a really positive step. Another thing that happened in 2019 is Matilda House was opened in Cowley, which is probably about two and a half miles away from the centre of Oxford. Uh, this facility uh, costs £3.7 million. Pounds. It's um, a facility for people who are rough sleeping. And it's got 37 beds in there. The, um, the facility uh, that I talked about in Freud's Row has 56 beds. Um, so these are, be these are the two new developments that have come through in terms of providing um, specific um, specialised uh, shelter, shelter services to people who are in, you know, experiencing homelessness. We also have um, a house uh, which is for women. Um, so uh, across the country, there is a massive increase in the numbers of women in particular who are experiencing rough sleeping and homelessness. Now, um, all the organisations that focus specifically on providing assistance for women in this situation uh, say very clearly that one of the biggest drivers towards um, creating um, uh, homelessness for women is domestic abuse, is sexual abuse, is domestic abuse. Now, because of the um, because of the austerity measures that have been carried out over the last 10 plus years, there's been huge cuts to these types of services and um, domestic uh, abuse charities will, will provide you with more information about that. But women's shelters, refugees, etc. have dwindled across the country, including here in Oxford. And a lot of services are operating on far less money than they've ever had. And so obviously there will be a knock on effect. And this also applies to people who have complex needs. So people who have addiction issues, for example, be it drugs, be it alcohol or anything else, the, the services have been dramatically cut. And so this is also one of the reasons why there has been an increase in uh, particularly in rough sleeping across the country. Um, so in Oxford, we have um, a property um, which is owned by the uh, city council and it is a specialist uh, house for women who are experiencing homelessness and it's, it's a four bed property and it's for women who um, have started to overcome some of the challenges that they're facing and they have been engaging with the various services across the city and so this means that they are in the what they call the homeless pathway which is the homeless system um, which frankly is not working well anywhere uh, including here in the city which it does need reform but um, it is good to see that there is this there is this specialized um, uh, service uh, a house basically but obviously there's, there's only four beds so we need much more than that um so i just also want to quickly move on now to giving you um just a bit of an overview of the other things that are happening as well i don't know if any of you have come across the housing first model the housing first model was developed in new york in the 1990s it's a model which basically says that in order to um assist people particularly those who are sleeping rough on the streets uh, the priority must be to house people so whatever their um, other issues are so be it addiction problems be it mental health issues whatever the complex issues are they these issues can only really be tackled if a person has a, a safe secure roof over their head so this model was developed in, 90, in the 1990s. It's being uh, rolled out across Europe more and more. And here in Oxford, we have a housing first model. Um, in, uh, we, have a, we have six one bedroom flats in South Oxfordshire, which is um, being provided by a housing association. Um, and as I said, they're following the housing first model. And right now, because of COVID-19, we have seen the government urge all local councils across the country to ensure that people who are rough sleeping or those who um, have very precarious funding, uh, sorry, very precarious housing, um, are moved off the streets and immediately put into accommodation. So there was a scheme that the government rolled out um, uh, at the beginning of the lockdown. And I think it was at the second week of the lockdown, um, where the government made an announcement to say that the local councils across the country must ensure that every person is put into um, accommodation. So um, a scheme was developed called um, uh, Hotels for the Homeless. And so um, funding was made available 
for councils to uh, basically block book hotel rooms across the across the city. So here in Oxford, we've we've uh, seen the council block book forty rooms at least forty rooms, and these these numbers are fluctuating as well. So they're going up and down. Um, and so people have been put into um, safe and secure accommodation. Now the problem here is, or well, the challenge here is, that when your lockdown, when the lockdown is lifted, it doesn't mean that people are no longer homeless and they no longer have these needs. And so there is a lot of concern about what happens next. And here in Oxford, what we're trying to do is really um, extend this homeless first model, and we're looking to do that. But across the country, there's been a lot of reporting um, on um, people who for the first time in their life have managed to get themselves into a hotel room, which means that they no longer have access to a drug dealer, for example, or any of the other kind of, um, you know, the challenges that they're facing in terms of, you know, the day-to-day -day issues that they face. But just to be very, very clear, I uh, say this very clearly, not everybody who is experiencing um, homelessness or rough sleeping has an addiction problem. And even if they do, that's not the point. The point is they still deserve to be treated with dignity and to have a roof over their head, as we all do. So these are the types of things that are going on in Oxford. Um, now, obviously, if you're going to be looking at homelessness, you can't separate housing from homelessness. Um, Oxford has one of the highest um, housing house prices in the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, the average house costs 11 times the average salary. Now, this is absurd and it's very, very hard for people who want to raise in the city, I'm one of them, to be able to um, really find housing that is affordable. And the same applies to rents. And in the past uh, couple of, I'd say about two years actually, there's been quite a lot of movement and quite a lot of focus on this issue of rents. Um, one of the biggest um, reasons why the homelessness is increasing so rapidly in this country is, uh, is because people are facing evictions from their rented accommodation. So section 21 is a, a, a law that basically means your landlord can come along and give you notice with no reason at all just to decide that you need to leave their property. So there's been a lot of pressure put on um, abolishing section 21, which is actually happening. The government agreed to adopt this. Um, during the, well, I was going to say during the COVID-19 crisis, but we're, not, we're still in it, so we're going to be in it for a long time. There's been a lot of focus on um, evictions and people who are renting and their rights. So the government very early on from when the lockdown started announced that nobody would be allowed to be evicted for the next three months of this lockdown. So obviously this is a positive thing as well. Um, but the challenges are really, really huge. And one of the biggest challenges is that there is not enough public housing being built. So not enough council housing being built. And in order to try and resolve aspects of this crisis, which is the homelessness crisis, we need to see at least 100,000 council houses being built. Now, in a city like Oxford, um, as I said, you know, um, it, is, it is one of the most expensive places to be able to buy a house in the whole of the country. We have issues around, you know, the use of land, so the green belt land. Um, obviously, um, we have two uh, universities. We have uh, which, which, you know, student accommodation, uh, and rent, uh, a lot of students end up renting um, properties and, and rooms, which could be available for. Um, uh, residents of this city for example. Um, so there's a lot of challenges and a lot of uh, pressure on the housing stock that we have. Um, and so there are there are a lot a lot of challenges there but I think that the most important thing is to see movement in terms of this housing first model uh, which is funded by local government, national government and also housing associations. Um, and we also need to see um, we need to we need to understand the fact that you know what, what is it that leads people to becoming homeless you don't just suddenly become homeless now for a lot of people who are on the streets if you spend any time with them as i as i do um you will understand very quickly that there's a lot of complex issues that people have been enduring from a very young age and often there's a lot of uh, history of violence sexual abuse this applies to women and men but specifically for women this this is one of the biggest drivers um, for homeless, for street homelessness and also for homelessness. So I feel like there is now starting to, um, we're starting to get a better understanding of what's going on. Now traditionally in this country, how um, homelessness is 
a focus for the public around Christmas time, as it is around the world. And, you know, there's lots of drives to raise money and charity funding and all that type of thing. Um, but I think because of the um, absolutely uh, huge numbers of people on the streets before the lockdown, it's really impossible to go to any city or town in the, in the, in the UK and not see people who are uh, rough sleeping. And I think this has made people ask lots and lots of questions about what's going on, and this can only be a good thing. Um, so I'm going to wrap up there, but um, one other thing I'm just going to quickly throw into the mix. I apologise, I'm, I'm suffering from Ramadan brain right now, so I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, so I'll finish up on this point. Um, I'm also the co-founder of the Labour Homelessness Campaign. Um, we established this campaign two years ago, and the idea behind the campaign was very straightforward really. It was to um, amplify the voices of people experiencing homelessness in all its forms across this country. And obviously the, the, the clue is in the name, the, it's called the Labour Homelessness Campaign, I'm, I'm a Labour City Councillor. So we wanted to, uh, well we still want to influence the party to make radical policy change around homelessness. Um, and we're very proud of the fact that our campaign is really focused on, as I said, amplifying the voices of people impacted by this crisis. And um, one of the things I'm most proud about as a city councillor, so I've been a city councillor for two years, I had the great honour of being elected as a councillor in the city, which is my home city. Um, I worked um, a lot with women who, uh, were, who are experiencing rough sleeping and um, we uh, collectively um, you know, did a lot of very powerful work together, collecting each other's, collecting women's testimony, um, enabling women to listen to each other and find out things they didn't possibly know about each other, even if they were sharing the same spaces in terms of when they were homeless. Um, and I think this has really um, helped um, sharpen um, the council's mind around the specific issues around gendered homelessness and also LGBTQI people and communities are being impacted very heavily by rough sleeping and homelessness. Um, there's been a massive increase in young people being impacted by street homelessness as well and uh, most of those people, are, a significant number of those people I should say, are members of the LGBTQI community. It's one of the reasons why they're, having, they're ending up on the street because of their identity. So I, I'm someone who's always advocated for um, an intersectional lens to be applied across policy and if we are to tackle homelessness we have to not just look at it in a, as a silo issue, it needs to be looked at holistically so we have to look at it um, through the lens of all policy because housing is central to everything um, so yeah so I, I think I'll end there and um, someone just asked for my email so I'll put that in the chat and there's a couple there's a question from Naomi I don't know if I'm supposed to answer questions now but I think I might just go quiet and then someone can instruct me on what I need to do next so thank you thank you so much councillor that was so that was very informative and helpful um, I can't see who has a question, but if you do, you can speak now. Sorry, I think it's Naomi. You there, Naomi? Oh, I had a question about like the funding, where you get the money for houses like that, for a person, a house that you have for women in, in Cowley and et cetera. Yeah. So the, the, the big funding that I talked about was the, um, the, the homeless shelter funding. So we're talking about 1.9 million um, for Floyd's Row and 3.7 million for Matilda House in Cowley. Now that money, um, the uh, local authority, so local government has to um, apply for that funding from, from central government. So you have to put forward your proposal and you have to cost it and all the things that you know about. Um, and then you have to bid for that money. So that's where that money is coming from. And uh, when it comes to the um, smaller property, the one, the four bedroom property, um, this is done in conjunction with housing associations who find properties, for example, um, and uh, they then um, um, make them available to um, housing services who then um, not they kind of well, I'm trying to think of another word. I'm trying to not use the word takeover. It's not a takeover, but they basically work in collaboration then with the service providers to ensure that those services are then um, being uh, provided to the individuals who are in in that particular property. So it's a combination of um, 
local there's some local government funding that's obviously available but it's been drastically cut and um, central government's funding which they say they're increasing but it's not enough um, however it, you know they have made funding available we have to be fair and clear about that um, and then um, housing associations provide some housing stock as well which they then um, work closely with um, councils um, to make that all that make that financially viable for them and for the council um, so that's basically where the funding comes from but to be very clear the funding is a drop in the ocean uh, we definitely need more of it and I want to could argue there could never be enough funding you, you know how much how much money do you need the money will just be endless but actually um, as I said to you it's, it's not just about housing uh, to end homelessness we need to have all the other holistic services being given proper funding to support people um, and we need to also address a lot of the issues that start very young for a lot of people who end up finding that there is no there is nowhere for them to access any help um, so right now because of lockdown we're in a very particular situation where people are not necessarily on the streets in the in the numbers that they were before the lockdown but it would be a fallacy to suggest that people aren't still on the streets because they are and in, in particular i forgot to mention this earlier on so apologies but in particular um, it's migrants so people with no recourse to public funds so if you're a migrant in this country you're not allowed to access um public uh, funding right so you become really really vulnerable so again this goes back to my point about housing um and homelessness policy you can't just be siloed immigration policies um, deeply impact homelessness and housing as well. Domestic violence, domestic abuse, um, people's intersectional identities, you know, persecution of people's gender, it all impacts. So we have to have a, a cross-cutting, um, you know, policy that basically understands why people become homeless in the first place. Hello. Um, can I... Thank you. Councillor, for your uh, insights. I wonder if you draw any, um, if, if you see any uh, connection uh, between uh, uh, homelessness and, and men mental issues and the whole homelessness, if you have a practice with that. Yes, um, thank you so much for asking that question. Absolutely, of course. Um, you know, if you, right now, nobody can really walk through the streets of Oxford, but before the lockdown and before COVID-19, um, took hold in this country um, it's really impossible to walk down any street in central Oxford in particular without meeting people who are experiencing homelessness and you can very easily see people in a very distressed state um, you know for example people not with no shoes on I mean it's just incredible that this is going on um, earlier on in my intro it was mentioned that I'm an aid worker one of the reasons why I decided to stand as a counsellor is I've spent more than 15 years working around the world um, uh, in mostly conflict impacted countries. Uh, my last job was with Medicine Sans Frontier in northeast Nigeria, where there's an insurgency going on with Boko Haram and the Nigerian military. And every time I come back to my home city of Oxford, which is where I'm from, where my family live, I'd be horrified by what, what I was seeing in terms of pe the numbers of people on the streets, but also the, the stress that people are in. So yes, absolutely, mental health is really, really pivotal. And I think in this country, it's an issue that's been taboo for too long. And partly it's because of the British psyche, the culture of stiff upper lip and all that nonsense, right? I'm very pleased to say that there's a more um, deeper understanding now of, homeless, uh, of um, mental health and how it impacts people. Um, across their lives and across all the spheres so yeah we have to have a holistic approach and also if you if you've been subjected to a lot of abuse throughout your life from a young age or if you have ended up going down the road of addiction then of course you are going to end up having profound mental health problems it's just impossible for you not to um, so I think we need to have a better understanding of that but we also need to make sure that it is very much um, integrated into any response Um, so I've got a question as, as well, if possible. Um, yeah. I assume you operate as an LTD? What's an LTD, sorry? Uh, as a limited company? Or how do you operate? As a charity, right? Uh, I I'm, I'm work for the city council, so I, well, I don't work for the city council. I'm a city okay. councillor, so okay. we don't... Right. Anyhow, it doesn't really matter. I was just curious about that. But um, there's this 
thing called property uh, guardians, right? So wouldn't there be an option to rent out those properties straight from landlords and then give them the required amount or whatever it is per month and then place those people within as property guardians uh, lowering the costs that currently, you know, I, I would assume we currently have quite high costs of buying properties and refurbishing them and so on. So wouldn't that be a, obviously it's a more of a short term solution, but would it, would, wouldn't that be an option to reduce the number of people that are on the streets right now? So as I said, um, one of the challenges is, it's not just about reducing, obviously nobody should be on the street full stop, just to be very clear about that. There's no excuse for anyone to be sleeping well in one of the richest countries in the world, okay? Uh, housing alone or accommodation alone will not enable people to rebuild their lives. It will not enable them to feel safe and secure to do that. So the question about mental health there, it, it feeds into this answer. So we need, we need to have... Um, accommodation that is um, not only safe and secure but where people can actually access the services they need so um, your question is a good one um, there are um, the, the city council does work with private landlords um, to house particularly families who are homeless so um, that model is already in place right but what I'm saying is for for people who have additional vulnerabilities um, well, if you just put them in a property and that's it, that's not going to help them um, move forward with their lives, right? So they need they need to have more more um, support. So um, that's something that's really important to remember. But yeah, private landlords are housing people across the city. Um, uh, people who qualify for pub, uh, for private uh, for housing, I should say, um, do. Um, get their rents paid by the city council it goes directly to the landlord um, so that's already happening but yes of course we should be investigating lots of different approaches to this issue of housing because that's at the heart of you know homelessness is ultimately if you want to tackle it then we have to like I said we have to build more affordable housing now this term affordable housing doesn't really mean anything any, anymore to most people because it's simply can't afford to ever think about dreaming about having their own home so increasingly we're going to see more and more people renting so they need to be protected as well so yeah that's valid um, one more question so yeah um i just wanted to ask about what you think the potential of the um university is in terms of doing more to tackle homelessness um so i work with tower street um homeless action but um, I didn't know if you see any potential in terms of vacant rooms and um, staffing as well. Um, whether, yeah. yeah. So thank you for your question, Bethan. I have to say it's very much hashtag boom, that question it very much speaks to me, so thank you. Um, yeah, I think it, it's, really, um, it's really naive for us to think that both the universities, right? So the, the Oxford Book and the University of Oxford don't have a role to play. Of course they do. We all have a role to play in the city. Uh, you know, it's just, it's ridiculous for anyone to suggest that the university should not be part of the solution. So yes, um, there's been a lot of student activism, as you know, and a lot of long term activism around these issues. Um, I think that there should be a more honest and um, robust dialogue about what's going on in the city and the way that the universities, both of them, um, but particularly the, the University of Oxford, how it does have such a big impact on the people of the city in terms of, you know, um, every, it's a beautiful city, no one denies this, right? But we, 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 um, we, um, we have to be honest and say that, you know, the, the kind of, the sort of, um, the fact that the, the colleges are right in the center of the city um, does impact, uh, you know, the house prices and everything else because everybody wants to live in the city because there's, there's a strong kind of desire to be in Oxford it's, it's a city with lots of jobs for example our hospitals we can't have a, we can't get enough people to work in our hospitals right at one point there's like 2,000 people uh, vacancy across Oxfordshire's Oxford's hospitals it's because people can't afford to live here so there is a problem but I'm not going to put it all on the door of the university just to be clear but I do think that you know when uh, empty buildings for example when the college uh, colleges uh, you know, um, accommodation is empty, then we should be asking ourselves, well, what do we do with the accommodation during the rest of the time? What happens? There's a lot of empty buildings, as you know, um, in, in Corn Market Street and the High Street, there's a lot of empty buildings. So there's now a discussion going on about what do we do 
to bring uh, these buildings back into public ownership and make them public spaces. So I think that discussion has been going, it's been on and off for a while, but it needs to be more consistent. And I also think there needs to be less defensiveness from the university when they're asked questions, uh, and I use the word university as a big entity rather than individual colleges, you know, what is its role in relation to this? And I think we have to look at places like um, the US. So, you know, John, Johns Hopkins University, Yale, other, other big institutions that you can compare to Oxford, they've, they're doing this thinking as well. And I think there needs to be a bit more joined up thinking about what happens with very prestigious elite institutions and their what's the word I'm looking for, their duty of care perhaps is the word I'm looking for, the words I'm looking for, to um, people of that city and, and to understand the impact on the city as well. So there is a divide between the town and the gown. It, it's impossible not to be able to see it visually, but you know, it, there is, right? There's like a massive change and a shift in um, wealth as soon as you head out towards the Cowley Road and towards the real, the real Oxford. And I think that we have to be able to question why that is and what is the role of universities in that as well. Thank you so much, uh, Councillor. We actually have to cut short now. No problem. I'm going to put my email in there. Thank you so much to all four of our speakers for giving such informative talks this evening. I think all of you have helped the participants contextualize a lot of the challenges that they will be looking at this weekend. Um, before we move into the